Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Addicted Mind podcast. My name is Dwayne Osterlin. I'm your host. And today we have two amazing guests. First is Susan Herrick, and she's going to talk about her book, Slow Dancing with the Devil, A Son's Substance Use Disorder, A Mother's Anguish. Susan is going to share her story about her son's fight with addiction and the loss of her son, Luke, and how getting treatment was so difficult and hard, especially around getting medical treatment and treating addiction as a medical disorder and using science-based treatment. And it's just a heartbreaking story of the loss of her son. And our second guest on this episode is Dr. Aaron Gupta. He has written a book, The Preventable Epidemic, A Frontline Doctor's Experience and Recommendations to Resolve America's Opioid Crisis. So we're going to talk to them together about these two pieces of trying to get treatment and the treatment professionals trying to treat these individuals who are struggling and the barriers to that process. And so I think this episode is really informative. It's it's heartbreaking. And I'm just so glad that Susan was willing to come on and share her experience to help support others and also to have Dr. Aaron Gupta's experience as well coming from the medical side of this. So I hope you get a lot out of this episode. I think it's very informative and has a lot of really good information. And if you are getting a lot out of the Addicted Mind podcast, please write a review in iTunes. That really does help the podcast get found. For all the people that have taken the time to do that, thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, stay tuned for this episode. All right, everybody, welcome to the Addicted Mind podcast. I have two wonderful guests today, Susan Herrick and Aaron Gupta. And we are going to hear Susan's story of her son and his struggle with substance use disorder. And we're going to hear from Aaron from his medical expertise in that journey. And so we're just going to start there and go in. And Susan, why don't you introduce yourself first? And then we'll jump over to Aaron. And Aaron, you can introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about how you came to to be here. Okay. My name is Susan Herrick. I'm a retired professor of speech and theater. And I wrote a book called Slow Dancing with the Devil, a book I really would rather have not written because it is about the story of my son and how he lost his life to substance use disorder. I'm so sorry that you're you're here and I'm so Thank sorry you. that you know we have to in a way have this conversation but I'm also grateful that you are here to have this conversation so we can help others with our losses, right? I think that's what we do. Well, the reason I wrote the book truly is so no mother would ever have to get the same kind of phone call that I did telling me that their child, in my case my only child was gone. Yeah, that's yeah. so hard. Thank you for being here. And, and maybe we can, we'll can we get into that story and kind of talk about a little bit of how that happened and what you noticed and what you right. went through and, and all of that. Aaron, you want to introduce yourself and, and tell us maybe a little bit about your part in this journey? Yeah, I was born and raised in India. I came after finishing my medical school. During that process, my mother got sick with a condition called myelofibrosis at the age of 48. And she needed a bone marrow transplant 50 years ago, which was not possible in India. So she had to die at a young age, and mm. we didn't have the resources to bring her to America to get that uh, treatment done. I have been a primary care physician since 1986. I've been a deputy medical examiner, a jail physician, in addition to working in the hospital, in the nursing home, in the office. And I have seen a lot of doom and gloom. In 2006, two things happened. I was relieved of the jail duties. I became a member of American Society of Addiction Medicine. I wanted to learn and see what's going on in the addicted world. And I was also invited to become a member of the Rotary Club. So 17 years of addiction, I've been 
educating people around me who said wanted to hear. And about six years ago, one of my friends said, you should write a book. And I laughed at her and I said, that's not going to happen. But it stuck in my head. I wrote the book. I was invited to speak last year at the Rotary International Meeting in Houston. And in January of next year, they're writing a story about my work and my efforts trying to solve this crisis. So having said that, I've saved hundreds of lives month after month, uh, 85% success rate. My patients don't overdose. They don't die. They don't need to be hospitalized unless some crisis happens. And this treatment is not being implemented in the nation because there is no education. I had to self-taught myself. Less than 0.5% of the providers provide care. 6% of the patients get help. And only 2.4 million people have the access. Rest 41, 40 million people have no access to care. And that is because of the limits, regulations, oversight, and unnecessary regulations passed over the last 20 years to control the pills and the pill mills while the street drugs are killing people. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. And I think that goes to the title of your book. Can you, can you give us that as well? Well, the C- CDC has consistently said, like this said for COVID, addiction is a preventable disease and is treatable like any other chronic diseases. But despite the fact we have an effective medicine available since 2002, the access to care is limited, restricted, and overly regulated, and doctors have been prosecuted, the treatment arm has been prosecuted, so a preventable disease has become a nightmare. And because they do not go back and look at the regulations which are working, which are not working, so they keep on passing more regulations because the previous ones are not working. So it's a pile of regulations on top of pile of regulations that uh, the regulators need to back off and let doctors be doctors and take care of the patients. And, and to help them get better. And, and, and we don't have to worry about our own license and livelihood or, lose, or going to jail or being prosecuted. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So let's jump back over to you, Susan, and, and let's hear a little bit of your story and how this started and how this kind of evolved. And as, as a parent, kind of uh, seeing this process and witnessing this process. Well, our story really begins around the time Luke was born, really in the early 1990s. And that's when Purdue Pharma owned and operated by the Sackler family, created the most dangerous drug ever known to human civilization, which was called Oxycontin. When my son was 14 years old, the medical profession was passing it out like Pez. Luke had a pyelonidal cyst. So afterwards, they gave him Oxycontin. Now, at the same time, this is when his father and I were going through a divorce. and. Mm. Years afterwards, I asked Luke, I said, um, when did narcotics first come on your radar? And what he said, he said, Mom, when I was 14, that nurse gave me a little white pill that not only made the surgical pain go away, but all of my pain go away. And from that point in time, it was on his radar. Now, he had it for the pyelonidal cyst. And he was, he was, he was 14, it. you said, at that time. He was, he was 14 yes, years old. Yes, that's, yeah. that's very that's young, the first a Very time. young brain, too. Very, very young brain. That was the first time. Then he had thumb surgery. Or, uh, he sprained his thumb. He was given it again. He had his wisdom teeth taken out. He was given it again. Thumb surgery sprained his thumb. So by the time he was 17, he was very dependent on it. And I at first took him to a psychiatrist who told me, no, he's just bipolar. So they started him on Depakote and lithium and Seroquel, right. which totally, I mean, made him crazy. I was fortunate to come across a psychologist who said, Susan, you've got a very depressed young man who has found out that drugs can keep the pain away. He said, there's one drug called Suboxone, which if you can find a doctor to give it to him, you can wean him off of it and he can have a great life. Well, yeah, I started searching and found found out. Now, this was 2006. 
that there were three MDs, because, of course, I asked the psychologist. He said, no, only an MD with a special kind of waiver. And I thought, what do you mean? They're, they're passing narcotics out like crazy, and yet I have to find a certain kind of a doctor, and I only found three. We had to travel 90 miles. I was very lucky that he could get us in. And he walked Luke off. Luke's grades went back up. He was feeling good so much that he was not on anything anymore. But then really the unthinkable happened. My son was traveling down to visit his grandmother, and he was in a near-fatal car accident. 27 broken bones. Really, he was crushed. And they did not expect him to live. After a week on a ventilator... They said he was going to pull through, but I turned my head and I looked at all of those drugs pouring into him, and I thought, we are going to have a worse problem than we had before. And actually, that's exactly what happened. That is when we really began our slow dance with the devil, thus the nature, or the, the, the title of my book. We were really caught in a rock and a hard place because this is the time where some doctors were prescribing up to the pain level. And after six weeks in the hospital, they had Luke up to 800 milligrams a day, which is end-of-life cancer care. And then they released him and told us to go find a doctor out of state, and that pretty much was all the direction we got. We had 18 months of trying to figure out what addiction was all about, what these drugs were about, what it was doing to him. And at first, I I did find a treatment center and thought 30 days would be enough because that's what they right. said. And they, they tried to talk me into leaving him in for the 60 days or 90 days outpatient. But I wanted him home. I thought he was cured. I thought he right. was well. And that was obviously the farthest thing from the truth. I then had I had learned about the three C's to ask, did I cause this? Can I control it? Can I cure it? And started to have to look at my codependency and that my trying to manage his use of drugs was not going to work. So in a moment of clarity, I walked into his room after finding a needle. And by that time, I pretty much felt that he was going to die because of this, and I did not want to be the one to find him. So I I was really honest with him and said, Luke, you've got three days to get out of the house, no money, no credit card, no car, nothing. I will get a restraining order if I have to. I will not come in here and find you dead, or you go away to a full year of treatment as far away as I can get you, because if you stay around here, there's going to be too much temptation. And I walked out of his room. I was fully expecting him to come in with another one of our big blow-ups. And instead, he came in with tears in his eyes, saying, Mama, I've tried everything I know how to quit. I don't want to live like this. Right. I, 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 I need help. You could see his own desperation caught in the in, oh. in this disease and and see like yes. the the person doesn't want this they they don't want no. it it's painful it's awful it's yeah just painful and awful and you could see it in him yeah and and the the shame that it created yeah. in him because he had sold some of my jewelry he he sold a lot of his own things and the more he did that just to get more drugs, the worse he felt about himself. So it's 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 that terrible cycle. But yeah. a challenge we had is I did get a treatment center way out in California to accept 
him, we had to jump through so many loopholes with insurances in network, out of network, but I had to get him on an airplane. And right. he was coming off of the drugs in withdrawal. So I knew if I found some Suboxone, well, I couldn't find a doctor to take him. Wow. And I was just dealing with time. So we had to go to the street and find Suboxone enough to get him on the airplane. That's an incredible story of, you know, a mom trying to help his son, you know, in that desperation. I want to go over to Aaron and and talk to Aaron about this piece of it, because you had said earlier, all of this regulation, you know, here is this, this drug that could help somebody, yet you can't get it, yet you can get the opioids, you know, oh, yeah. pretty easily, but yet okay. this drug you can't get. So I, I want to understand that, Aaron, a little bit in that context. So addiction is a chronic disease like any other condition. If you look at diabetes, high sugar problem, the incidence is the same as that of addiction in America. Yet every diabetic has access to multiple doctors, specialists, 20 plus medications, and still the outcome is not very good. In the addiction field, like I said, 41 million people at risk, only 2.4 million people can get one of the three medications and they need it for the rest of their life. Yeah. So the yeah. regulations were created to people not abuse a boxer on the street. And that led to criminalization of the treatment arm. When the waiver the law was passed, it's called Data 2000, it said after a doctor takes a course, pass an exam, and apply for an XDA number, they're only allowed to see 30 patients per month for the first year, expandable to 100 patients per month thereafter. That means we have to reapply. The DEA and the SAMHSA have to approve it. And in 2005, they re went and visited the law and said that it is useful, but there is a little bit of diversion. Think of that. OxyContin is at a peak in 2002, 2003. There is no diversion control plan. There is no restrictions until 2010 when they told them to become abuse proof. My issue is, had Suboxone be in place of OxyContin, we wouldn't have this discussion. Right. The Suboxone right. medicine has been delayed by 50 years, and then they made it a Schedule three drug. If they would have made it a commodity, like for diabetes and hypertension, we wouldn't have this issue then, and we wouldn't have this issue today. We wouldn't have to give Narcan free. We can give Suboxone free to people and, and say, hey, you don't have to worry about your license. I have 1.4 million Rotarians worldwide who are willing to step in and say, well, go home to home or let the patients come to the church and we'll give them the daily suboxone. But the regulations have to be relieved. For, for, for doctors to feel safe, to be able to work with this population and, and help them, they have to feel that they're protected on some level. Yes. And if they're not, then... We're in this situation where these life-saving drugs are restricted to a point where, like you said, Susan, earlier, you could barely get them. You, could, you couldn't even find them. Well, right. And, and more than that, Luke had to have some surgeries afterwards. So here he is. He's clean. He's going to school. He's got his life going well for him, and he has got to go back in for a major surgery. Once again, placed back on the drugs, and I was once again shocked that we tried, I, I tried so hard to let all of the doctors know he has substance use disorder. He has an incredibly high tolerance. When you do surgery on him, you're going to have to walk him down a different way than you would normal people. The looks on the medical profession's faces were, what are you talking about? They didn't know what he needed. They, Many of them did not know what Suboxone was. I was fortunate that after his first surgery at Duke, the head of the pain clinic there sat down and he devised a protocol. 
He also contacted the anesthesiologist saying, we need to be very careful what anesthesia we use on him so he doesn't escalate. But he right. had to create a protocol because there were not any. And I'm talking about the year 2015 when this happened. They walked him down on methadone, and luckily we were given it at home that we could give it to him, but he got addicted to the methadone. So we put him in a, he decided to go to a treatment center for 30 days to help get off of everything. Yeah. And three weeks after that, he had a blockage. First thing they did was shoot him up with morphine. I called up the insurance company, said, I need to get him back in so somebody can walk him off of this, and was told, oh, we only allow them one treatment a year. And I said, no, 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 he he had surgery. He was put back on this. It didn't matter. And then once again, we were on our own trying to find Suboxone. Luke went, reached out for Kratom T for a while to help him. So, you know, and and we had to do this four separate times because so he in had a way three Luke was really rockets. fighting with you. It sounds oh, like you were goodness. fighting together to yes we were to fight this disease. Like you were doing it as a team. And I, I think I, I I know that sounds kind of weird for a lot of people to understand. But like when you work with people in addiction, they want to get better. You know, they Absolutely. want support, they want help. Absolutely. And then when they run into these roadblocks of getting treatment, it's it's just so incredibly frustrating and heartbreaking because they want to get better. They want to do something right. different. And they're, they're truly heroes in mm-hmm. many ways. One of the stories that I have in the, the book, and it was the summer before Luke passed, we were standing out in the backyard, and we have a small lake out there, and and I had watched him go through three separate withdrawals, and I mean, painful, ugly, and as a parent, you you know, it, it hurts you when your child hurts, and I asked him, I said, honey, what does it really feel like? Can you tell me? And he said, mom, it's like if you threw a gallon of gasoline on me and lit a match. He said, every part of you is on fire from your brain cells to your fingertips to your toes, everything. He said, and instantly you've got a choice. You can sit there and let it just burn you up and burn you up for days. Or you can go jump in the lake, which means finding the drug to put out that fire. But of course, when you come out of the lake, the fumes start again. So when people say they really want to get help, they don't want to live this way. What they're avoiding is going through that awful withdrawal. So when they want to go through it, that's bravery. But even back during this time, I didn't really understand the true strength or the, uh, the the help that Suboxone really could offer, when I think back, he would not have had to go through this this terrible withdrawal. And I think Aaron can really help fill in those blanks from a medical standpoint. Aaron, I want to I want to ask you about that piece, and I hope it's okay. I'll call you Aaron or or Doctor Gupta. Oh, it well. is it is great. Yeah. Uh, okay. So around 2015, one of my elderly patients needed a revision of the knee surgery, and the orthopedic surgeon demanded that I take her, take him off the Suboxone for three months. I said, it's not necessary. And uh, Are you going to write the pain pills? He says, no, are you going to write it? I said, I'm not interested. But he forced me to do it. So the patient had some heart problem found out, and that required more testing. Then Christmas happened, then the surgeon goes on vacation, uh, three months was a living hell for me to take care of this patient's pain because that addiction had come back. Right. So what I do today is, since that time, I have a very strict protocol. I'll talk to any doctor, university, hospital. My patients will take half the dose the day before the surgery, 
none on the day of the surgery. It leaves the brain and the mu receptors that the hospitals and the anesthesia people and the surgeons can give the pain medication during surgery is necessary, and then give the pain pills for two, three, four, five days. Most of my patients do not go on pain pills because they're afraid and they don't want to go right, that path, and right. they go back right back on Suboxone. And I may increase 25 to 50% of Suboxone for the next few weeks if, if they are feeling pain, in addition to taking some non-steroidals. Can you tell me a little bit technically of the difference between the Suboxone and the regular treatment? Like, why is that different? The regular treatment of an opioid versus doing that and, and a little bit how that works so people know why there's a difference there. So there's a mu opioid receptor in the brain which very tightly binds with the suboxone molecule called buprenorphine. Once the regular narcotics leave the brain, this binds very tightly, and then the regular narcotics have no effect on the brain. My patient taking suboxone, if they go and want to have a party, they can blow thousands of dollars and have no effect. It's all right. waste, right. okay? But if they are in withdrawal, uh, if, if, they are, if they're taking narcotics and they take my medicine, Suboxone or buprenorphine, then they get a precipitated withdrawal and they'll get violently sick and then end up in the hospital with blood pressure dropping, vomiting, and diarrhea. So that's the difference between regular narcotics and Suboxone or buprenorphine. Got it. Got it. And so that, that helps clients, if they're struggling with that, maintain their, their sobriety and create kind of, I guess, a a buffer against use. Would that be right? Yes, yes. They have no no desire to use any drugs. Slowly and slowly, they quit smoking cigarettes, quit using marijuana, and, and they're happier than anybody else because they're reunited with the family. They go to church. They excel at school and work and jobs, buy houses, cars, pay taxes like you and me, and they're normal people. And they're the de most decent people that I come across in my in my practice. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important to say. And, you know, to me, you're also allowing the person to develop community because community is what's, what brings joy to our life. And, you know, by helping them with this addictive process, right, that they're stuck in, you can't, you can't have community when you're in an active addiction. It's, I think it's really hard, but once they get relief from that, then they can build the things that are meaningful to them that I think is even more, makes them more resilient over time. So they have abandoned, their families have abandoned them because they burned so many bridges and they don't yeah. want to step in anymore to help them out. And uh, I have generations above and below come and thank me for saving my kids, my husband, my spouse, my child's life. And, 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 and the community is very, very thankful. Yeah. I'm the only yeah. doctor in town who does that. You know, Toyin, but I, I wanted to in interject something here. After Luke's last surgery, which was 2017, he picked up his golf clubs again. And the dopamine, the feel-good feelings really clicked in for him. And that's when he started his own company. He finished his associate's degree he got into an Ivy League's special program. But a challenge that he had was that the community groups that he was with, a lot of them, if anyone were to take Suboxone, they were no longer considered part of the community and they had to start their time over again and Luke's last surgery it broke his heart yeah because he had surgery and came off of it but he needed suboxone to help him and they said okay you lost your time you got to go back to square one it devastated him and also the last summer that he was alive he had broken his hand during COVID so he could no longer play golf. So the dopamine depletion was starting to come back in. He had been on so much for so long. He did find a physician to give him Suboxone, but they told him he lost all of his time and that he couldn't even be on some of the Zoom calls. And for him, That's awful. Uh, it 
Yeah, I, I mean, and and the the research and it's not that I did informed. It's not medically informed processes there, right? They don't well, understand how how our brains work and how some of these medications work to really really help people. Exactly, but they're using the science from the 1930s when AA was started, and my theme point for my entire book really is that substance use disorder is a disease, not a moral failing, really? and yeah. the, the whole thought that comes from the 1930s is that it's a moral failing, and after Luke passed away, I mean, I really delved into research. I had to know why. I had to figure all of this out. I wish I had known Dr. Gupta then. Luke probably would still be here. But unfortunately, you know, he's he's not. But But people need to understand this, and it needs to be taught. One of the things that, that truly surprised me is how few doctors know what substance use disorder was. I thought any psychiatrist would know, and I was stunned to find out that they're not taught addiction in medical school. And I think, Aaron, you can fill in more here about really yeah. how many doctors who truly understand this disease are out there. It's, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I was also under the impression as a physician that the psychiatrists are trained to be addiction doctors. And when I was researching for my book, I found out that is absolutely not true. I called my friends in Ivy League schools who, who are in psychiatry. They said that is true. So there are 38,000 psychiatrists. One of them have limited education towards addiction like I do. And, and a bunch of them don't practice addiction medicine. So according to American Society of Addiction Medicine, there are 7,000 doctors and professionals that are associated with it, and a bunch of them are board certified some way or the other into addiction medicine. My son is one of them, and he has zero patients. We had a Dr. Pompey in town. He was board certified in six different things, including addiction medicine, and he's out of work for the past six years because he was alleged over-prescribing medications. So if we do things that have poor outcomes in America, according to a physician, is nutritional-related things and addiction-related things. And metabolic syndrome we call as nutrition-related obesity, diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. and addiction. If they are not taught in American medical schools, that is the main reason that we have bad outcomes. If I want to change something today, is start teaching nutrition and addiction to the doctors in the medical schools. And, and, and more, there has to be more incentives and less disincentives for doctors to learn and practice addiction medicine, or we are on a downward slope uh, at a very fast pace. We were losing 10, 15,000 people 20 years ago. Per year, it's up to 110,000 last year, and it's going up 30, 40% year after year. And the street drugs are killing, doctors and pills are not, and, and the regulations are in place against that, pills and the doctors. And so they're really not able to, no one's able to get support because of these regulations that, that prevent doctors from being able to do this, this life-saving work for, I guess there's a lot of reasons in there. I don't understand them all, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it's, it's stopping this, this, this process. And, that, and that's heartbreaking yes. too, to hear. So one more thing about the stigma, it really started with 1914 Harrison Narcotic Act that was trying to control the trade of illegal drugs around the world. And it said a few things. Addiction is a moral failing and is yeah. not treatable. Yeah. And it also said a doctor cannot prescribe another addictive drug for an addictive condition. So methadone is class two. That's why doctors are not allowed to write methadone. They have to go to the federally funded clinics. And Suboxone is class three and is very restricted. So the access to care is very, 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 very difficult. Uh, that has yeah. to change. The stigma towards the disease, stigma towards the treatment, and stigma towards the success of the treatment. I have several hundred patients who are doing very, very well, but are afraid to come forward and say, look at my story because my parents may not know, my grandparents may not know, my children may not know, my work may not sure. know. So if we can showcase these people, others have no incentive. 
The other thing that I, I'm, I'm bothered by is a lot of people say, let's stop stigma. And I say, how are you going to stop stigma? So stigma is starting with, we need to create mandatory education for medical professionals, policymakers, and insurance companies on addiction, better vocabulary, empathy, and humanity. So I was in discussion with a large company yesterday that works with hospitals and, and insurance companies. And they said, okay, you create this. I said, I'm not educated to create this educational material. I'm telling you guys that somebody has to create it and then start teaching people and then let medical professional and insurance companies um, read them and, and, and discuss them. If we don't take that effort, it's not going to go away. Yeah, and I think what you're saying about like you know the, some of this doctrine back in the in the in the you know 1914 and in the 30s and all that time, you know it really set the stage where addiction was this moral piece of moral failing, and then also mm -hmm. so that prevented research, that prevented treatment care, that prevented people from learning about it and investigating it, and you know I think part of my thought is is that, you know, some of these communities form, these 12-step communities form because they had nowhere else to go, nowhere else to get any kind of support. And so they had to do something. These people who were struggling with addiction had to go somewhere and they created these communities, but they, but it wasn't through a, a medical lens, right? And that belief system as well. And, and I, I think these kind of conversations challenge that and, and help us move in, in a way that is evidence-based, science-based, that can help people really get better. Not that these communities aren't helpful. I don't, I don't want to say that they they're, are they're, they're incredibly important. Oh my gosh. And yeah. so I don't want to say I, that, but I yeah. hope these communities can start to bring in the science too and, and bring in, in that piece and combine those things together. I think that would also be, be powerful. And as Aaron's saying, bringing in that medical piece so that people are educated mm -hmm. and know what's going on. I totally support that. So some of my patients who go to A and NA, they have learned not to open their mouth and say we are on Suboxone. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, yeah. there's a lot of animosity. Yeah. At the same token, my patients go to the pharmacy or emergency room or go see another specialist. Or they just downgraded. You are a junkie. You are an addict. When was the last time you did yeah. needles? And they are not treated with humanity at all. And so I think we need to change the curriculum starting from the medical schools to the policymakers to the insurance companies. Absolutely. Even yes. though in 1962, the Supreme Court ruled that addiction is a treatable disease, is no more moral failing, the policymakers and the insurance companies have failed to capitalize that and kept the momentum going in the same direction. Hey, there's something deficient in you. Uh, you don't deserve a better life. And so the value of human life in these people in America has gone down the drain, and, and that needs to be corrected. Absolutely. Susan? One of the things that I, I'm, I'm hoping will happen, I was having a conversation with, the, with the, one of the scientists who gathered all the information for a paper that was published on, on the uh, precursors of addiction. I mean, I never knew that there were precursors. Well, they put together and I said parents need to get this information because so much is out there but it's written all in medicalese and as a professor of speech I know that in order to get something across it has to be at a fifth or sixth grade level so you've got this vast graduate level information and so many parents out there so many people out there they just don't have access to what's really going on. Two things that have happened in the past few years is Beth Macy's Dope Sick opened the door to the public to understand at their level what substance use disorder was really about, how things progressed. And then you have the uh, Netflix painkiller series going on. The information gets out to the public in an understanding way. This is what I hope to do with my book. And happenstance, my son's best friend is an actor out in Los Angeles, and he was just devastated with Luke's passing. As a matter of fact, he is the one who got me to write the book 
because wow. within a couple of weeks, he said, Susan, we, we've got to get Luke's story out there. Everybody thinks that when they hear of an accidental overdose, that it's a junkie going down. They don't think of an Ivy League student, a businessman, a doctor, a lawyer, a barber. You know, they they have that stigma picture. And a lot of it was Hollywood. You know, that's yeah. how Hollywood put it out there. And so Jacob has put a team together and the screenplay named Luke, taken after my book, is starting to go too. So it is my That's hope exciting. that I, I can bring a lot of this complicated message to the public in a much simpler form to help people because it it has to get out there. It, it breaks my heart on Facebook when I see these mothers grieving. Yeah. You know, 300 young people are going down a day, 300 a day because of fentanyl and their comments. Well, he was an addict. He just couldn't beat the demons. And I keep saying he had a disease that nobody knew knows how to treat. He didn't know how. So it's it's an uphill battle. But I mean, podcasts like yours, everything, anything and everything to help educate others about what we are really dealing with. It's a heartbreaking story, Susan. It's just, it's it's heartbreaking. And the, the loss of life and the tragedy that follows when it's preventable and treatable is, is, is just heartbreaking. So, gosh, I think we well, could talk a lot. Well, go out to get high at yeah. the end. You know, he was what they call dual diagnosis. He had general anxiety disorder, and he would get very wound up. He asked for a clonopin. Yeah. So uh, my take on that is there are two conditions happening simultaneously, some kind of mental disorder and then pain and addiction as the second part. And then if you don't control both the conditions adequately for a longer period of time and stabilize the patient, then patient is at risk of getting destabilized. So I have 85% success rate because I control their mental issues with non-addictive drugs and then help them sleep, rest their mind, they're not doing risky stuff, and they don't get upset easily, and that's how they can get back to work, and then they're back on Suboxone. So, yeah, the two conditions have to be treated as simultaneously. The problem is if you go to the psychiatrist, they say you got a mental problem. If you go to the primary care doctor, he doesn't know mental disorder versus addiction. And if you go to the addiction doctor, they think everything is addiction, the mental thing's going to get better uh, once the addiction is cured. And that is not true. Yeah, whole whole person care. So, okay, we're we're getting on our, our time here. So what I like to do is I like to ask, uh, as, as we kind of wrap up, I like to ask all my guests one question. And, and the question is, if, if someone out there is struggling and you could tell them one thing, you'd want them to know one thing, what would you want to tell them? What would you want them to know if you could tell them just one thing? I go back to the theme of my book, You Have a Disease. It's nothing to be ashamed of, but you need to go find somebody who can help you get the care that you need. I would send them to somebody like Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Susan. Well, I wrote a paper a few months ago, and I said we need a, a strategic change in our policy how we treat addiction. So first, yes, find a doctor. First person has to be willing to get help. You don't need to get admitted to a month or three months or six months of an addiction hospital because you know, still need somebody like me to provide the medication. And then find a doctor that, that you can get to help uh, on a regular basis, uh, like for diabetes and hypertension. And it's definitely, we need to change the policies to improve access to care and destigmatize the treatment. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Thank you both. So before you go, how can people find you? Susan, how can they, they, they find your book and, and how can they get a hold of you if they, if they have questions or want to talk to you? How can they do that? My book is on Amazon or the Barnes & Noble. You, you just have to Google Slow Dancing with 
the devil, Susan Herrick. I do not mind if people get up with me at all. Can I give them my email? Yeah, we can put all those links in the show notes too. So, okay. yeah. It, yeah, it is um, sbherrick13 at hotmail.com. I've dedicated the rest of my life to helping others. So no mother ever gets that phone call I did. And that's what I want to do. So if I can help anyone, reading my book is excellent. Reading Dr. Gupta's anything to help get more education. I'm here. Oh, thank you, Susan. Thank you for just having the courage to put your voice out there in such in 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 all of that pain and and honoring Luke in that way. It's such a, a he beautiful tried thing. so hard. Yeah, like, I know. He tried so hard. Yeah, he did. I can hear that. And so I can many see of that. them do. Yeah. So many Absolutely. of them do. Mm-hmm. And and Dr. Gupta, if people want to get a hold of you. Yeah, so I have a website called thepreventableepidemic.com, and here's my book title, and uh, I also have a 501c3 SOS Serious Opioid Solutions. Can you see it? Yeah, and I can link <laughs> that in the show notes too, so people will be able yeah. to to link yeah. it, and you can give me that URL too. So Yeah, um, I will. Um, yeah, it's called uh, HTTP sensible opiate solutions.com got it or i can email, i can email you yeah e- email it to me and what i'm going to do is i'm going to put it on the show notes on the addictedmind.com so they can go to the show notes and they'll be able to get all the links sure yeah yeah my my book is coming out uh end of november or beginning of december they're in the final stages so <laughs> That's great. So I encourage everybody to, you know, get your books and and read it. And if you have a loved one that's struggling, you know, uh, get there's them. Hope. Get, there's hope. And, the, yeah, there is hope, and you've got to hold on to that. You you never ever 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 stop fighting, especially when they want it. You got to keep fighting. You got to keep fighting. Dwayne, finally, if you want to talk to me individually about my experience treating people, I'd be happy to join you some other time. I would love to do that, Dr. Gupta. I think I think we'll we'll we will set that up because I think you have a lot of information that's really, really important for people to understand and in your way provide that education that you want to provide. So thank you both for coming on to the Addicted Mind. Thank you both for sharing your expertise, your wisdom, your heart, your passion. I just I just really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Addicted Mind podcast. As usual, all the links will be in the show notes at theaddictedmind.com. So check them out there. And if you want to continue the conversation online, join our Facebook group. Just go to Facebook, type in the Addicted Mind podcast, click join. And you can find us on Instagram at Addicted Mind Podcast. And don't forget, If you got a lot out of this episode, click the subscribe button and share it with a friend. All right, everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will talk to you on the next episode.